from WISP Politics in Madison. You're listening to Capital Chats. Hello, everybody. This is Kate Morton with WISP Politics here with a Capital Chats podcast brought to you by Spectrum. Today, I'm here with my colleague, Adam Kelnhofer, who recently interviewed Assembly Speaker Robin Voss. So, Adam, we always have a lot of questions for Speaker Voss. Uh, What did you guys touch on during this interview? Hi, Kate. Yeah, we always have questions for the Rochester Republican. So we touched on a lot of things here from impeachment to redistricting to diversity, equity and inclusion. So let's just get right into the interview and hear what Speaker Voss had to say. All right, everybody. Today, I am joined by Assembly Speaker Robin Voss. He is a Republican from Rochester. And we are going to talk a little bit about uh, impeachment efforts here. Um, So first question, uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Devin Lemihue uh, plans to send this redistricting bill to a committee and allow the committee to work through the the legislative process. Uh, Liberal Supreme Court Justice Janet Protosiewicz could announce any day that she's going to hear the redistricting case, which has been the subject of a lot of challenges for a lot of people and, and debate. Um, if she decides to stay on on and the Supreme Court accepts the lawsuits before the bill in the Senate uh, moves forward, um, are you going to go move forward with that impeachment proceeding? Well, first of all, Adam, let's start by saying that that is the absolute last resort. And I continue to be an optimist that when someone makes such an unprecedented announcement during their campaign, uh, when you raise your right hand to take the oath of office, you sometimes, at least hopefully, uh, take a step back and realize that your responsibilities are a lot more than those of a candidate. And you have to make sure that you do what you can to uphold the Constitution. And I am an optimist. I think she will end up recusing. So I don't think she's going to sit on the case. So I don't think we'll ever have to get there. But whether she does or not, I still think that the path that we laid forward uh, to be able to say that we have a nonpartisan redistricting process, we literally adopted, you know, over half a dozen amendments, each of them addressing a concern that a Democrat had raised about why they were making up spiritless arguments about whether or not our bill would be somehow a gerrymander. It's not. It's the exact Iowa system allowed under our Constitution. So this is the hypocrisy that my hope is we go through the Senate process where they're required to have a hearing. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we thought that since we're adopting the plan that they put forward, uh, that, you know, and they've talked about this ad infinitum for the past 20 years, that getting it done as quickly as possible would be something Democrats would climb aboard. But unfortunately, we've now seen the very authors of the proposal say that somehow uh, this model isn't perfect, even though they've said it was for 20 years. So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy. It allows us to take a deep breath. Uh, Justice Protosiewicz can do the right thing and recuse. We can also continue to move forward and get our nonpartisan redistricting plan before the governor so that we can have a different process, take some of the heat uh, off of the situation and allow the people of Wisconsin to talk about other issues instead of the made up ones that the Democrat Party has focused on with impeachment. Okay, Uh, that makes perfect sense. So with that redistricting plan, we actually heard at least one Democrat on the floor. Um, I wasn't watching the floor. I had to to take off early for uh, a cousin's wedding, actually. But I did get to see one Democrat on the floor um, while I was leaving. Uh, She talked actually about possibly supporting the Republican maps. Have you been in talks with any Democrats about this redistricting plan and how it's going to move forward? As of this point, uh, we have not, but that process is beginning. We wanted to allow the process to happen in the Senate because one of the biggest arguments that they, again, looking for anything to shoot down on why we wouldn't have a nonpartisan redistricting was that we didn't have a hearing. So that hearing will happen in the state Senate. Um, we'll be able to listen to the actual concerns because when we watched the debate and we were there for hours, no one criticized the bill. They criticized the process, which is kind of a, the last uh, argument of a straw man, right? That you don't really talk about the substance. You talk about the way that it's gotten done. Uh, then you focus on, you know, the motives, which aren't important when you read the bill. Who cares why a bill was introduced? It doesn't really matter if it's the priority that you say you're for. So my hope is that Democrats, as they take a chance uh, to look at the bill and actually read it, because many of the people who have commented on it haven't even read the bill. They just bought the talking points from Ben Wing. So at least take the time to read the proposal, realize that it's a carbon copy of Iowa uh, as much as we can. It's actually a little bit better even. Um, But I would say it's really a good process uh, that we're going to go through and hopefully Democrats will engage. We'll engage with them and we'll get some over the finish line. 
All right. Um, so uh, with this uh, panel of former Supreme Court justices looking at the recusal and impeachment issue, um, when do you expect to get a report back from those former justices? And will you release the report publicly? Well, first of all, it's not even as formalized as a report. I just want to get opinions from people who, you know, understand the law, have worked with the Constitution for decades to say, what are the precedents if there are any around the country? Uh, is this something that, because don't forget the legislatures, there's two-step process. It's it's kind of like a, a trial that you would see in a traditional setting where a district attorney files charges. They have a grand jury saying, look, is there even enough to have a trial? Uh, and then they go to a trial and determine whether or not the person's guilty or innocent. So our first step in the process is significantly easier than a trial and finding somebody guilty. So uh, it certainly is a possibility, but I want to understand the process. I want to understand what's happened in other places and ultimately make sure that whatever decision we make is the is grounded in the Constitution and it's grounded in the law. OK, that makes perfect sense. Um, but I will say uh Myself and I know a lot of other reporters would like to see whatever those Supreme Court justices say to you. So um, if we get our hands on that, that would be awesome at some point. Um, and chances are it'll be released. But again, we're already getting, you know, uh, the left is attacking the people who are just going to do a review, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason that I didn't want to make this into some kind of a public spectacle, because I know that the left is so desperate uh, to get power through any means necessary uh, to gerrymander whatever they want to with the maps, even though they talk about being anti-gerrymander, that's a bunch of BS. Uh, and then they ultimately will do whatever they can to gain power. I didn't want this to be some kind of a public flogging of the people who volunteered to be part of this, which is exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. So I think my initial decision was right. Uh, ultimately, I would like to put it out for a public review, but again, it's not really a public document. It's certainly not a public process. There's nothing in statute to do it. It's just people giving me advice. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I guess I kind of want to move on here. There's been a lot happening at the Capitol lately. Um, since your comments to uh, my colleague Kate last week about uh, UW pay raises and, and withholding the pay raises over DEI issues, have you met with any university officials about that issue yet? And has there been any kind of change in tone with those talks? Uh, I have spoken with officials from the university. And, and the irony is that for much of the past 20 years, I have been one of the defenders of the UW system. Uh, I'm a former regent. I care a lot about making sure we have a highly skilled, highly talented workforce, and the university system plays a super important part in that role. Mm -hmm. But I have gotten so many reports, Adam, and, I, and I'm saying from people who work in the university, from parents who were at orientation, from students who were in the classroom, where it's no longer allowed to have a differing point of view. You kind of buy the company line or you don't do well in class. You buy the company line and you're shouted or you're shouted down. You're not allowed to have speakers on campus. The university has decided that instead of just being the independent arbitrator to make sure points of view are heard, they are going to pick one that's the right one, quote unquote, and indoctrinate kids whether they want to or not. That's got to change. So I don't think what we're asking for is some kind of a draconian step. I'm not saying you can't go out and try to recruit kids from rural areas or veterans or people who are minorities because I want to have a diverse workforce and I want to have a diverse student body. But intellectually, we shouldn't assume that everybody will believe the same things. There are two sides to the climate change debate. There are two sides to the free speech argument. There are two sides to almost every single topic in the country. But to make it seem like there's only one preferred or even allowed point of view is where the university has gone seriously astray. So I think it's not unreasonable to say that free speech should be the number one goal of uh, academic rigor on campus, not saying if you don't believe this, you're going to get a feeling great. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I think, where we are too far too often. So it's fairly easy to get to an answer. The university just has to accept, first of all, that there's a problem. And number two, that they want to work on a solution. Uh, I think that they have been so used to living in an ivory tower where very few people criticize them that they're surprised that there are people who actually have a different point of view from their own. So I give credit. I, I feel like they are listening and we're going to find a way to get through this. But it's not going to be easy until people realize there actually is a problem that needs to be solved. Are any Senate Republicans on board with the, uh, the withholding the pay raises uh, threat? You'd have to ask them. I mean, I, you know, as a co-chair, um, it has the opportunity that it has to be scheduled by me and Senator Kappinga. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm, I'm pretty determined that we're going to fix this problem. Or, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Fixing is the wrong word because it's not like you can just pass a bill and things change. Mm -hmm. But the tone and the attitude have to be different 
or they're going to have serious long-term problems. It's going to make the university system less competitive. It's going to make Wisconsin less strong. And ultimately, if we don't have an intellectual argument to be able to make, uh, they should just work with us to find a good one to be able to solve the problem. So uh, State Superintendent Jill Underly uh, talked a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion in her State of the uh, State of the Education address in the Capitol. Um, what do you think about DEI in general in any school? Is there any room for it anywhere? Because uh, Underly was arguing it kind of creates this idea of change and working with people who aren't exactly like you um, and. Uh, you know, that's that's her pitch. So is there any room for DEI at any grade level, do you think? Well, Dr. Jill Underly is one of the major problems of education in Wisconsin. Uh, she fights all of our reform efforts. She believes the only answer is spending more money. And ultimately, she is a major part of the problem that we have with education in Wisconsin, as we see far too many kids that can't read and far too many kids that aren't graduating in our habitual truants. So I think, first of all, Wisconsin has to acknowledge that she's a part of a big part of the problem. Uh, but if you look at what the issues are, again, I want a diverse workforce. I want to make sure that every single child, no matter what zip code or the color of your skin is, has a chance to be super successful staying in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but that focuses on the idea that, yes, we want every kid to be smart. Uh, not every kid learns the same way. I understand that. But the idea that we're going to tell kids that there's only one valid way to believe, there's only one valid way to think, that you have to accept things that are against your moral conscience or against your religious tenets or against what you've been taught by your parents, that's wrong. That's not the job of the education system. The job of the education system is to make sure that you can read and that you can do math and that you understand the history of our country, but not only one side and make it seem like the people who discovered America were somehow cruel colonizers. Right. I mean, there were certain things that you have to learn and say, yeah, that was a mistake in society. No problem with that. But the idea that you have to make kids, you know, who are in the second, third, fourth grade admit their white privilege. I mean, all this kind of crap. That is what's making people turn off from the public school system and widely embrace things like school choice and homeschooling. Now, for a lot of parents, that works. But I don't want to say that the kids who are left in the public school are just going to let them fend for themselves. We need to have a system that's fair that's impartial, and that ultimately focuses on the goal of getting smart people through the system to become better citizens in our society. And that doesn't mean indoctrinating them with one ideology and saying there's only a certain set of beliefs that are acceptable, and the rest of that just have to be cast by the wayside. All right, that makes sense. I will say she did actually praise the uh, reading bill, the phonics-based reading bill that the legislature passed. Oh, yeah, after she tried to kill it. I mean, she spent so much time trying to kill that bill, as did the department, that they had to be pulled along pushing and screaming about taking the bill to actually get to a point where it could be signed. And now they're trying to take credit like it was their idea. We could have done this a long time ago had they not been so obstinate. Um, but luckily, we got it across the finish line, and now we're going to make sure that reading actually improves in spite of DPI. Okay. Uh, I got time for one last question here. The uh, Brewers deal, um, have Milwaukee officials reached out to discuss the, ro the required local contribution in the Brewers bill? It's about $202.5 million. Um, is that going to come down at all or are, and are locals actually willing to pay that? Uh, well, they have reached out. We're gonna. Uh, we've been talking for some time about this topic all the way back to when we did our shared revenue bill. So this isn't mm -hmm. a new topic that somehow has sprung on people. Yeah. Um, I will say that when you look at what happened with the Milwaukee Bucks, there was a local requirement. When you look at what happened with Lambeau Field, there's a local requirement. So this isn't something that's brand new or out of the ordinary. If you have a huge economic driver in a community, you have to have a partnership. So of course you have the local government, you have state government, and ultimately you have the private sector team who has to be a part in making it successful. It's what happened at Lambeau. It's what happened with the Bucks. So this is not something that is abnormal. Now, I get it that they don't want to pay anything. They would like to have it for free from somebody else. Well, it's hard for me to explain to somebody from outstate Wisconsin why they should pay more than they already are. I mean, the deal we put together says that if you live in Spooner or Eau Claire or Rhinelander or Burlington or anywhere else, 
it's cheaper to keep the uh, the brewers here than it is to let them go because the team pays so much in income taxes from the out of state players who of course if the team never played at uh, amfam field again we would never get those dollars so mm-hmm. we're putting a chunk of money in but so is the local community who gets the most direct benefit imagine if the milwaukee brewers left what a negative impression that would be on the city and its ability to attract more talent more jobs more young people to move to our state it would be catastrophic so i don't think they want that to happen but it means they need to say it's just as important a priority to keep the brewers here as it is to fund the library or to make sure that we have a a strong police department and everything else it's part of uh, the fabric of southeastern wisconsin especially the city and county of milwaukee and that's why they just i I know in the end they'll step up all right uh that is all i have time for and uh i just want to say thank you speaker voss for joining me on capital chats today thanks adam have a great day thanks you too Um, Well, Adam, thanks for sharing that interview with us. In the meantime, if our listeners want to learn more about the redistricting and impeachment discussions, they can head to our website at wispolitics.com. That's right, Kate. But for now, I'm Adam Kelnhofer. I'm Kate Morton. Thanks for tuning in to Wispolitics Capital Chats, brought to you by Spectrum.